Hello, everybody. Welcome back. This is Critical Reasoning Lecture 5. And the goal for today's lecture is just to talk briefly about deductive validity and inductive strength and what those look like on paper, what those look like in practice, as it were. There is a lesson in particular about deductive validity that's important and that I want to get to. So I'm actually going to uh, share my screen here and we're going to uh, uh, write some things down. Um, so here is uh, a document. So let's, let's start with uh, deductions. So here's a, here's a sample argument. Um, I don't know, how about something like this? Uh, let's say um, uh, all swans are birds, that's premise number one. Premise number two, um, Greg is not a bird. And so therefore conclusion, Greg is not a swan. Okay, um, so question first, is this argument valid or not? You might want to pause the video and think about it for a second. This argument is indeed valid. Um, so to see that, right, I'm going to try to imagine that uh, the premises are true and conclusion false, okay? So in particular, if the conclusion were false, then Greg would be a swan. And so by premise number one, Greg would be a bird, right? Because premise number one says that all swans are birds, and if Greg is a swan, then he'd have to be a bird. But premise number two denies that Greg is a bird. And so our assumption that the conclusion is false um, must itself be false. That is, <clears throat> um, Greg is a swan if premise number one and premise number two are true. Okay. Um, I don't know why it doesn't like my spelling of the word conclusion. That certainly looks right to me. Uh, anyway, um, so that's a valid argument. And um, there's a little piece of reasoning there to show you that it is indeed valid. But now here's, here's something interesting and important about, about valid arguments. In general, so I'm, let's write this down. As a general rule, and in fact, there are exceptions to this rule, and, and Mark's story talks a bit about them in, in the textbook. I'm not going to worry about them here. They're, they're not going to bother us very often. Um, they're interesting fringe cases to think about in certain cases, but, but this general rule is important. Uh, in its own right. And the general rule is that uh, valid arguments are valid by virtue of their form. Okay. And what that means is that the what what makes an argument valid has really very little to do in general with what the premises and the conclusion actually mean. Validity has much more to do with structural features of the argument. And in order to isolate those structural features, in order to isolate the structure or indeed the form of the argument, what you want to do is to try to strip away all the non-logical vocabulary from the argument itself. So let's 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 uh, apply that to the argument we just gave, so I can try to illustrate what I what I mean by that. So if we look at premise number one, we have all swans are birds. Okay. Well, swan and bird are not logical categories; they're not logical terms. But all 
is a good logical word. And R is a good logical word. And so we might say, if we're trying to write down the form of the argument above, we'd say, well, the, the shape of premise number one is something like this, all S, let's just leave it as an S, R, B. Right? And so here I am abstracting from the actual content of the argument, in particular swans and birds. Those things aren't important. Right? Uh, all some things are some other things. Right? I need two sort of class terms, but the, the meanings of those terms aren't really important here. What matters is only the, the, the sort of structural relationships here. And if I were to write down premise number two in an abstracted sort of way, um, well, Greg is of course not a logical term either, but, but um, you know, we'll, we'll leave uh, uh, some indicator in the argument here in the form in order to, to, to illustrate what the, how the argument proceeds. Premise number two might look something like this. Um, G is not a B, okay? I'm actually going to uh, uh, revert this back to a lowercase g because uh, that way we can sort of preserve the difference between individual things like Greg and I'll, using lowercase letters for those things versus category concepts like swans and birds. Notice the plurals there because we're talking about a kind of thing, not, not just some individual thing. And I'll use capital letters for those, okay? And so then the conclusion would be G is not an S. Okay. Now, <clears throat> um, here is really the crux of the matter. Here's really the important thing to say about what we mean when we say that validity is a matter of an argument's form. We could fill in these letters, S, B, and G, with any other terms, we would want to preserve the, the sort of uh, uh, categorical shape, right? We want to fill in S with a category concept and B with a category concept and little g with some individual thing. But if we do that, then regardless of what we choose for S and for B and for little g, the argument will by definition here have the very same form and indeed it will still be valid, right? Because the validity doesn't depend on what the meaning of the word swan is or the meaning of the word bird is or the meaning of the word Greg is. It depends on these interesting uh, relationships that are expressed in this argument in terms of these logical words all and not and so on, okay? So in particular, let's, let's fill it in in a different way, okay? Here is uh, a different argument, but one that has the very same form as the one we just looked at, okay? Uh, so this will be premise number one. And we'll say, let's, let's use another category concept that starts with an S, like say all seashells are, uh, and we need some category concept that starts with a B. How about um, bears? Okay, premise number two. Now we need a little, uh, an individual thing that starts, whose name starts with a G. How about, um, let's say, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Gabriel uh, is not a bear. Conclusion, Gabriel is not a seashell. Okay, now that's, that's obviously a silly little argument there, but it's got the very same structure, the very same form as the argument with which we began. And because of that formal symmetry between the two arguments, we know that if one is valid, then the other must also be. And in fact, we know that the first one is valid, and so this one must also be, silly though it is, right? It's certainly not true that all seashells are bears. <clears throat> 
who knows what who Gabriel is and whether or not Gabriel's a bear, uh, or whether or not Gabriel's a seashell. But we do know that if it's true that all seashells are bears, if it were true, you have to think sort of counterfactually in this case, right? If it were true that all seashells are bears, and it were true, moreover, that Gabriel uh, were not a bear, well, then in that strange universe that we've just constructed, it would have to be true there that Gabriel uh, not be a seashell, okay? Which is just to say, again, that, that this argument is valid. And indeed, it's, it's valid in just the same way, for the same reason, because of the same underlying form uh, that makes the first one valid. Okay, so this is, this is the general rule that I'm trying to illustrate here. This is um, uh, very important. I'm gonna bold it and underline it, um, right? Whenever you can compare an argument to one you know to be valid, and you can observe by making this comparison that they have the very same form, Right, then you'll be guaranteed that since the one is valid, this new one has to be valid as well. Okay, that is always true. If uh, an argument of a certain form is valid, then any argument of that very same form will also be valid. Okay, and that's 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 a very powerful, very powerful notion. Okay? Um, this is this is the sort of thing that that makes symbolic logic possible right we can talk about manipulating symbols and we can have a sense of which claims fall from which other claims purely by virtue of structures right and formal relationships among the symbols uh, and nothing to do with what they actually mean this is uh, uh, in another application this is also in many ways what makes um computing possible right the computer doesn't understand the meanings of the symbols that it manipulates but it can manipulate the symbols very quickly and very well and very accurately according to well-defined rules right and those rules in effect are the the form are the structure uh i.e the important bits of the of the system that that ground the validity of arguments that ground the legitimacy of, of moves and so on right? regardless of what the symbols actually mean regardless in the computational context regardless of the values that the, the variables contain in them right uh, you know subtraction works the very same way no matter which things you're subtracting one from the other right it's it's the rule that that matters right so here too, what makes an argument valid is the relationship that the conclusion has structurally to the premises that precede it. Uh, we can talk about valid arguments in terms of the arguments that follow certain rules. This will become very important for us uh, in a few weeks when we, when we get to uh, chapter nine and, and some of the more formal formal uh, elements of the book. This is not a class in symbolic logic, but I do want to give you a sort of taste of this. And so this will, this will reappear. I, I'm just sort of trying to prime you now. Um, the, the, the point for today is, since deductive validity is largely a matter of form, therefore we can, uh, um, illustrate some things about the nature of valid arguments by thinking only about arguments in terms of their form, by thinking only about how to manipulate symbols in the right sort of way, right? Uh, so imagine this, right? Imagine we had a symbol that represented the all, right? And we had a symbol for not. Well, now we're we're coding everything up, right? Now we're translating everything into the formal symbols of a new sort of language. And then we're going to be able to say some really powerful and interesting things about that new symbolic language, just given our understanding of what it 
what it is to be a valid argument. Okay, um, enough about that for now. As I say, we will we will have a bit more to say about this um, uh, later on in the course. Um, let's say a little bit about inductions now. I have less to say about inductions. Um, and in fact, we're going to spend most of our time talking about deductions. Uh, that will be true in philosophy quite generally because often deductions are the sorts of arguments that, uh, that philosophers give. Sometimes they deal in inductions as well, but, but very often philosophers are interested in the limits of concepts and so on. And so that sort of thinking requires, uh, as it were, the consideration of all possible worlds, which is, which is uh, uh, talking about possibilities, talking about um, whether it's possible to have true premises and a false conclusion, i.e. talking about deductive style arguments. Okay, but there is, there is another thing I wanna say about inductions. We said that in the case of inductions, what we talk about here is not validity, but rather strength. Right? And so um, uh, you might wanna pause the video for a second. Just remember, say to yourself again, what is it for an induction to be strong? Okay, so I'm gonna write down strength here. <clears throat> the idea is that an induction is strong to the extent that its premises make its conclusion likely. Okay. Um, <clears throat> again, by contrast with deductive validity, in this case, we've got a, a, a relative sort of term, right? I say it's strong to the extent that, right? strong to the extent that its premises make its conclusion likely, which is just to say that strength is not a one-off. It's not a black and white affair. It's a, it's a relative thing, right? Some inductions are stronger than other inductions. Uh, and indeed, it's relative to this likelihood, right? Do the premises make the conclusion likely? Well, how likely do they make it, right? Do they make it very, very likely? Well, then the induction is very, very strong. Uh, do they make it pretty likely, but not very likely? Well, then it's pretty strong, but not very strong, and so on. Um, so I, I just, I just want to think for a minute about, uh, which things affect the strength of an induction. Okay. Uh, well, there's, there's a couple ways to think about this. So they're in part because they're all different types of, of inductions. Um, here's a common type of induction, uh, a generalization. Okay. I observed swan number one and it was white. I observed swan number two and it was white. I observed swan number three and it was white. Okay. Um, I'm observing swans. And of course my inductive conclusion is going to be that all swans are white or perhaps equivalently that the next swan I see will be white, right? That's an inductive sort of move. I'm, I'm going beyond the evidence, right? My conclusion is not logically uh, guaranteed by, by deductive certainty, but it's nevertheless a reasonable conclusion to draw, or at least my argument will be strong if, well, if what, right? This is the question about which things affect the strength of an induction. Well, in the case of this sort of generalization type of induction, um, clearly one thing that affects strength is sample size, right? Well, how many swans have I observed? Have I observed only two swans? Well, then it's not a very strong argument, right? But have I observed, you know, 300,000 swans? Well, then it's a lot stronger. Okay. Um, now, you know, one thing that's, that we haven't said anything about yet is where the samples were drawn from, okay? And this is, this is another issue that affects inductive strength. Lots of uh, people in the West thought that all swans were white for a very long time. And then of course, they finally went, went to Australia and found, found some black swans, right? So the, 
the strength of your induction is not purely a matter of sample size. Uh, it's also affected by, uh, let's say, um, um, width of sample, right? How widely have you sampled and how many different contexts uh, have you sampled your, your uh, data at different times and in different places and so on? Um, here's a, another common type of induction. Um, I'm sure if we thought more about generalizations, we could come up with some, with some more things that affect strengths, but I just want to give you a couple for you to think about. Um, here's another type of induction, uh, an analogy. Okay. So the idea here is, well, you know, this case here that we're looking at B, speaking very vaguely here, B is really a lot like A. And A has this feature, F, and so probably B has that feature, F, also. Right? Um, we argue like this all the time. Uh, and philosophers, philosophers have argued this way, too. So here's, here's a famous argument in the history of philosophy that, that takes the form of an analogy. The universe is like a well-ordered clock. Think of an old fashioned mechanical analog clock. It's got these intricate little parts that are all synced up together to produce this uh, effective measurement of time that we call the clock. And it's clear in particular that all the parts of the clock were designed with purpose. Okay, so here's the, here's the analogy. The universe is like a clock. A clock has this interesting feature, namely that its parts were designed for purposes. Therefore, probably the universe's parts were designed with purposes. This is a, a sort of classic style argument uh, for the existence of God. Because after all, what sort of being could it be who designed the universe uh, or, the, or the parts of the universe to have certain purposes, but some higher being? Well, is that a strong induction? Well, right, all depends on the strength of the analogy itself. So here, in the case of an analogy, strength is affected by uh, <clears throat> the similarity of the two things being compared, right? Well, <laughs> how similar is the universe to a clock? Right? Well, you know, <laughs> uh, you, I think you can understand the original intent here. Well, the universe does exhibit this kind of intricacy of parts working together to, which, you know, and they sort of achieve these uh, these interesting macroscopic features and so on. The delicate balance of life. Uh, is kind of like this, or you know, water cycles on the earth, uh, rain fills rivers and then flows out to the ocean, and then evaporates back, right? So, there is this kind of intricate interplay of little parts, but on the other hand, there are some significant disanalogies as well between the universe and, and the clock, right? Um, the universe uh, encompasses all things. Uh, whereas a clock doesn't, right? Um, a clock is clearly made out of a couple different materials, but the universe is, is in effect all materials. So clearly there are lots of points of disanalogy too. The, the question is gonna be how strong do we think the analogy is, right? And the stronger we think the analogy is, the stronger we think the induction is that's based on it, okay? Um, you can see uh, the, the, the analogy and the argument are so close together. We even use the same word, strength, to talk about, to talk about both things. Right? Um, the, the argument that the universe has a certain feature, namely of having been designed, uh, uh, depends clearly on um, the um, 
this analogy with something else that has the property of being designed. Okay. Um, there are other types of inductions, uh, and in each case, there's something new that affects that affects the strength of, of the induction. But uh, I think you probably got the idea here, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop sharing for now and call this lecture done. Thanks, and see you all next time.